Well, we are in Genesis chapter 25 tonight, and um, going right on through, we've about had this makes us go halfway through the book, and there are things we haven't touched exactly, but I always pray and ask God to give me direction about what I need to deal with while we're talking about these chapters. Try to take it a chapter every Wednesday night um, instead of trying to compact every single little verse and get into every single little verse. So we leave some of the genealogies and things like that out. But tonight I want to read beginning at verse number one and we're going to go through verse number ten. Verse one through ten. And this is uh, the process of uh, Abraham dying, uh, what happened to him from the time that uh, we read from last time when Isaac married, and now through the process of him, his death. And it says, then again, Abraham took a wife and her name was Keturah. And this is Abraham's second actual wife. We know that he took Hagar, but she wasn't called his wife. Uh, but this was Keturah, his second wife. And she bare him Zimram, and Jokshan, and Medan, and Midan. Now, if y'all ever want a name for a baby, please be looking up all these names. And Ishbak, and Shuna, Shua, and Jokshan begat Sheba, and Dedan, and the sons of Dedan were Ashram, and let us him, let us him, y'all, and Leman, whatever that is. And it goes on to tell all about the children of Keturah, which is amazing. I want you to understand something about Abraham. Remember now, Abraham is like 135 years old, I guess, at this point. When he was 100, the Bible says that it was a miracle for he and Sarah to have a child. Remember? I want you to understand something. The strength that he received by promise still remained in him. God gave him a supernatural strength. It still remained in him. And I want you to think about the fact that the promises of God exceed the powers of nature. The promises of God exceed the powers of nature. We need to believe God for great and mighty things. Don't give up and don't quit. Here's Abraham bringing, is it six more children that were, that were listed here, if I'm not mistaken, into the world. His uh, posterity e expanding with, if you read on the scripture, you'll see that this was a great multitude of people that came out of his relationship with Keturah. So God blessed Abraham, but you'll see that during this time of his life, you're not going to see God appear to him as he did before the finishing of the promise which came through Isaac. And then the Bible said, in the, and unto the sons, of whatever, uh, verse number five, and Abraham gave all that he had unto Isaac. And of course, we know he gave gifts to these people as they left, but basically his estate he gave to Isaac. His, his, the promises of God, the transference of the covenant, all went through the line of Isaac. Verse number seven, and these are the days of the life of Abraham, or the, the years of Abraham's life, which he lived, a hundred, three score, and thirteen years, fifteen years, excuse me. Then Abraham gave up the ghost and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years, and was gathered to his people. In other words, Abraham had a good life and he was ready to leave this world. He had good days. And, and his sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Mech Machpelah in the field of Ephron, and the son of Zohar the Hittite, which is before Mamre. The field which Abraham purchased of the sons of Heth, there was Abraham buried and Sarah his wife. Another thing I wanted to point out to you here was that God brought his two sons together at this time of Abraham's passing. And no, I believe with all my heart, God is always in the business of restoration. He wants, to re rest he wants to restore what needs to be restored. There are some relationships you've had in your life that don't need to be restored. There are people that God took out of your life that need to be out of your life. <laughs> and you don't need to fret over that. You know, there are some things that don't need restoration. I know that a lot of us don't understand that, but we need to. There are some things, I think that once you're divorced with somebody, 
basically speaking, especially after you've gone on, one of you's married again, don't go back and try to fix that relationship. And there, there are things that people do in marriage that you know you can never forgive. That means you don't need to go back and fix that relationship. I've seen people try to get a marriage back together. I'm kind of off track right now, but this is the, I felt impressed to share this. I've seen people try to get a marriage back together, but the one person who was offended highly never could forgive, and they ended up on the rocks again. So everything that happens in your life and people that were in your life does not necessarily mean they're going to be there forever. So you got to let some things go. But just because you let some things go doesn't mean everything's going to go. And God is able to bring restoration to relationships. People that once were so furious at each other and such a breach between them, God is able to knit together and restore and bring peace and bring love back into I'm talking just friendships and relationships. So we need to always be open to God. Doesn't mean, like I said, doesn't mean everything is gonna be restored, but God knows what needs to be restored. Amen. And God will bring back into your life that which needs to be restored. I believe that with all my heart. And so God brought back these two sons and put them together at the death of this father. Now, verse 11 through 18 deals with the genealogy of Ishmael, not Ishmael, and I'm not going to go through that. So we're going to go on down to verse number 19. And the Bible says, And these are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham begat Isaac. That's, that's the genealogy <laughs> right there. Abraham begat Isaac. And Isaac was 40 years old, and he took Rebekah to wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Pandanaram, the sister of Laban the Syrian. And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren. Doesn't it seem like through God's plan there's a lot of barrenness before God brings fruit? Don't you see this happening all the time? Remember, we had this previously with Sarah, and now we have it with Rebecca. So it seems to be there, God will take you through some barrenness. God will take you through some pain before he brings about the promises of God. That's why we cannot afford to give up in the middle of a storm, in the middle of, of a barren place, when it seems like there's no answer. There's nothing deader than a dead womb. It's, it's impossible. But God is able, and the Bible says that Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren and the Lord was entreated of him and back Rebekah his wife conceived. And the children struggled together within her, and she said, If it be so, why am I thus? If, if this is the will of God, why are these babies, why am I having this? She didn't know what was going on in her womb. She just knew things weren't right. She said, If this is the promise of God, if this is what God has said, why am I going through this, this struggling, this problem in my womb? And she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb. And two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people. And the elder shall serve the younger. And when her days, and when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. And the first came out red all over with hair, like a hairy garment. And they called his name Esau. And after that came his brother out and his hand took hold of Esau's heel and his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was threescore years old when she bare sons, so he was 60 before the children were born. And the sons grew, and Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field, and Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison, and Rebekah loved Jacob. There was no child for 20 years in this marriage, 20 years. Now that seems, you know, you think, boy, 20 years. How many of y'all think 20 years sounds like a long time? <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> yeah, that depends on uh, how old you are. <laughs> I remember when 20 years seemed like an eternity. When I was 20, I thought I'd never be 40. You know, that's gonna be uh, 100 years from now, but I realized things happen. But 20 years is a pretty good length of time to wait on the promises of God. I'm telling you, come on. I'm talking about waiting, believing God, 20 years. And just because the promises were sure, 
didn't mean, this is something I want you to remember, though God had promised to multiply his family, he prayed anyway for increase. I want you to understand that just because you have the promises doesn't mean they're going to automatically come into your life. Some things you're going to have to pray through. You're going to have to pray through. You know, that's, that's like, um, you know, even when it's time for things to happen, the Lord said, ask you rain in the time of the latter rain. So even when the timing's right, you know, I, I think back in, in, in the book of Daniel, and he remembered that it had been 70 years since the promise of Jeremiah. Yes. And you know what he started doing? Right. He started praying. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So we've got a part to play. It's Absolutely. so important for us to cooperate. I like what one minister said. You put your hand, and then God puts his hand on top of yours. Your workers together with God. That's so right. that, that is such a great truth that we need to understand. It is the will of God in many cases. But if we don't That's contend right. and walk in. Psalms 44 was my favorite scripture today. It said, David said, we did not go into the promised land and take the promised land by our sword or our arm. But we went in and with your arm and your hand and your presence, we went in and possessed the land. See, they still had to go in right. and possess it even that's though it right. was God's power. So that's a that's great right. truth that the yes, church it is. needs to know. Yes, that's absolutely true. Uh, you know, these things of God are accomplished because we contend for the things that belong to us. Right. You know, that's just like healing. Just because healing has been provided, or even salvation, just because salvation has been provided doesn't mean people are going to get saved. Right. They've got to ask. They've got to go and appropriate the provision. Healing is not going to just happen to you because you're a Christian. Healing is something you have to go in and seek God for. You have to believe God for. You know, I don't know about you, but I pray regularly for health and strength and life. Uh, I pray for God to give me good health on a regular basis, to walk in, in divine health from God. So I expect to be healthy. I expect to be healthy because I contend for health. And I believe with all my heart that there are many things in life that God is, you know, everything was provided on the cross. There's nothing lacking in his provision. Right. Nothing. But a lot of us lack because we just think, I guess we just think it's just going to show up. Right. But you've got, you know, this is a walk of faith. This is a walk of faith. And I've got to reach in. I've got to believe. You know, I, I so often use it as a bank account. You know, just because there's money in the bank don't mean your bills are going to get paid. You have to start doing something. You have to go online. You have to write a check. You have to do something to get those bills paid. Even though the provision is in the bank, you could still be sued for not paying your bills. So it's important that we understand that all the, pro all the provision of Christ is done. It is a finished work. Everything has been done. I just strictly must be that person who truly believes all of it's mine. It belongs to me. Everything God promised Isaac was his. But when that child didn't come after 20 years, he began to intercede. I, read, I wrote this down. There was no child for 20 years. Though the accomplishment of God's promises is always sure, it's often slow. Sometimes God's so slow, isn't he? <laughs> come on. Slow and seems to be crossed and contradicted by God. Sometimes seems like God's doing the opposite. <laughs> That's why you got to trust him. You got to trust him. Contradicted by God that the faith of believers may be tried. Their patience. God wants us to have patience. I've heard people say, don't pray for patience. You better. You need patience. That the patience of believers might be exercised and mercies long waited for may be more welcome when they come. <laughs> when you've really sought God and boy you see a miracle happen, man I'm telling you what a great rejoicing that is. Because you've contended for that. And then it says while this mercy was delayed, Isaac did not approach to a handmaiden's bed like his father had. You know, the Bible says Isaac loved Rebekah. And he did not give in to the temptation, and, and evidently Rebekah didn't. Give in to the temptation to provide another way. Remember we studied? 
how Sarah and Abraham, they worked out another way. They arranged for him to go into Hagar. That was not God's plan. Right. And even though God waited a long time before Isaac, before, Isaac, before Isaac and Rebekah saw the coming of these children into the world, this child into the world, he did not violate the promises of God and go another way. He waited. And that's the temptation. May I say this to you? If God doesn't hurry up, we will hurry up sometimes. We will push. We will try to fix. We will try to manipulate. We will try to do the things to bring things that we, this is God's will, so I'm going to get this together. And I know this is God's will. God promised me this, so I'm going to do everything that I need to do to get all this to happen. That's not what you do. You contend. You sit still. The Bible says wait on the Lord. And, you know, wait on the Lord. Wait patiently for him in his timing and in his way. If it's of God, nobody can hinder it from happening in your life. Did you know that? You're the only one who can give up. But nobody else can. If God has a plan, if God has a promise, you're standing on the promises of God, you believe it with all your heart, you've got to keep your hands off of it. And you've got to get on your face and seek God and let God. And then if it still doesn't come, guess what? You still got to just rest. Luke uh, 18 and 1, most of you probably know this verse. And it says, He spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. You know why he said not to faint? Because if it doesn't happen in a hurry, we faint. We do, we get weak, don't we? We get weak and we just get the feeling like it's never going to happen. Uh, the tradition that I read about today in, in some of my studies is that he took uh, his wife to Mount Moriah where, where uh, his father had taken him to offer him as a sacrifice to seek the Lord. That's just a Jewish tradition. But regardless of it, I want you to know that there was agreement of prayer between Isaac and Rebekah. There's importance in agreement. Uh, I want us to go to uh, 1 Peter 3 and 7. This, this verse has got to do with marriage. If you're not married and you're, go not married and you're going to be, you can uh, look at it for future reference. If you are married, then you need to think about this. 1 Peter 3 and 7. It says, Likewise ye husbands dwell with them according to knowledge, just as dwelling with your wife, according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife. By the way, honor goes both ways. Yeah. Some people overdo this thing about you need to treat your wife like a queen. Well, if you want to be treated like a queen, then you need to act like your husband's a king. You know, don't expect it to be lopsided in just one way all the time. That's not the way it's supposed to be. <laughs> Somebody said the other day on, on Facebook that you need to tell your husband he's handsome, I thought. In his case, that would have been a lie. So I'm <laughs> you don't have to tell them they're handsome. <laughs> Well, that guy's not handsome. There's some people that ain't handsome. I'm sorry. Uh, what guy are you talking about? I ain't going to tell you. It wasn't you. It wasn't you, Roger. <laughs> but you might know him. But anyway, what I'm trying to say is that but you, you don't have to tell people they're handsome or they're pretty. But the, there's things more important than handsome and pretty. Respect. Respect and honor is what I'm talking about here. And it says, unto the weaker vessel, by the way, the wife is considered by God the weaker vessel. I know that's not popular. Then we go on to say, as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. If you're married, I just want you to, well, we talked about covenant, haven't we? I think I've handled covenant quite a bit in this process. Marriage is a covenant. Now, they came out in Louisiana with this covenant marriage. That's a bunch of, I don't care. You don't have to have anybody make you stay married if you don't want to get a divorce. That's what the covenant marriage is for, so you can't get a divorce. You, when a Christian enters into marriage, it's a covenant between you and God, between two people and God. So it's a covenant. I don't care if you got married in church, didn't get married in church. That's irrelevant. When you get married, when you say the I do together before God in a marriage relationship, that's a covenant between you and God. And the Bible says that that relationship 
is required to be joint heirs together. That's what we're supposed to be, joint heirs together. That's why you shouldn't ever marry an unbeliever. Right. Christian and unbeliever should never be married together because you can't be heirs together with people that aren't heirs. Okay? But if you're married to somebody, God's not going to let you approach him if your relationship is wrong this way. So if you've got a marriage problem, you're going to have a God problem. You've got to get the marriage problem right, surrender, and let God do a miracle if you want to be able to see your prayers answered. Now, I didn't say that. The Bible said it. It says your prayers will be hindered if your relationship is wrong with your spouse. So it's not an option. I got to figure out by the grace of God how to have a right attitude toward my husband. If I want to be in right relationship with God. See, that's what God showed me in my prayer closet those years ago when you shared my testimony with you. He showed me that there was a big block between me and God and its name was David Allen because I was wrong in my attitude toward David Allen. And I thought that didn't matter. I mean, oh, I love God. So me and God, it's, it's okay. I don't, he can just be the way he wants to be. I just love God. I thought I was a better Christian than him anyway. I thought I was. I thought I prayed more. I thought I read my Bible more. I thought I was more anointed. I thought my daddy told me, man, you ought to pastor that church instead of David. Come on. But when I got where I needed to be, God slapped me down on the floor and said, you ain't going nowhere past him. You ain't going nowhere past him. You got to get it right about him. Amen. I'm teaching something really powerful. Amen. So if you ain't married, don't seek to be married. Because <laughs> when you're married, you got this situation that you got to get right. Say, I don't care how much I loved God and how much I prayed to God and how much I read my Bible every day and how holy I was and how I preached and how I led praise and worship and all those things that I was doing, there was a big old wall up there between me and God. And only by the grace of God, God changed my heart and took that wall down by his grace. And so therefore, I got my heart right toward my husband. And now, guess what? Our prayers aren't hindered. I'm so glad that happened before our house burned down because, boy, I tell you, we've needed some miracles over this past four years, and God has provided miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle to get that house rebuilt. And now instead of a pastor, we have we got pastors. pastors. That's right. And you know the funny thing about it is, Brother James, you mentioned that, and I guess I'm kind of laboring this point, but this is important. Um, all those years, my husband never really felt free to call me pastor. Because I know he figured that if he ever gave me a position that I would lord it, I would be, I would be, you know, I was, I was a very strong, controlling woman. I was, I was, uh, had the gift of, of uh, management and skills, you know, to do all that. And man, I'd have just stepped right up if I hadn't had a strong man over there going, get down, woman. <laughs> and uh, I'm thankful today even though it sure did hurt a lot in the process for all those years that I suffered. But um, I remember the day. I remember the day my husband walked in the office. This was in 92 when God changed my heart. 1992 was when God did a miracle in my heart and started the work that he hasn't finished yet. He's still working. But he sure started it on that day. It was a miraculous start. My husband walked into the office he had had some pins made with the church name on it. And he said, look, honey, handed me that pen. I didn't even pay attention because you know what? Nothing mattered to me anymore. I didn't matter about position. I didn't marry about, none of that mattered to me anymore. He handed that to me and he said, look. And I said, oh, that's nice. Hand it back to him. He said, no, look. It said, David and Francis Allen, pastors. That was the first time that he'd ever call me pastor. And since then, he'd be glad to be just pastor all the time because <laughs> he knows, he knows that I know how things are. So he trusts me for the first time. When, when God took me through that was when I earned his trust. He could trust me. Not just, not, I'm not talking about sexually. That never was a problem. He's always trusted me. 
I'm talking about trusting me to be in my right place. Then he could honor me with freedom. Do you understand what I'm saying? I hope you can. I, I've always emptied my soul to all of you to make you understand what I went through. But there are a lot of women out there who really have a struggle with this. But I'm going to tell you one thing. Once you go through this, this and get it right with you and God, your marriage will be so much better. Your husband will love you more. Your relationship will be better. There will be peace in your home. You won't have to fight for anything. God will just give you peace and you can just walk through the days. It's just, listen, I'm going to tell you, God's way is always the best way. And, you know, I'd rather not be married than to be married with pain and agony and struggle and fighting and arguing all the time. So um, I hope I made that clear enough to my, help you understand my heart. Now the Bible says that children are a heritage of the Lord, by the way. Children are a heritage of the Lord and the fruit of the womb is his reward. <laughs> the fruit of the womb is his reward. So God gave them this reward. Now the babies were struggling in Rebecca's womb and she was troubled and you know what she did? She prayed. She sought the Lord. She didn't go around and get everybody's opinion. What do y'all think this is? I'm feeling funny in my tummy. No. She went to the one who knew. God help us to always go to the one who knows first. Instead of getting everybody's opinion. Let's go to the one who knows. That's what she did. And you know, uh, I've, got this, I've got this psalm. I felt so impressed just to go this way. And to do this psalm for you tonight. So if you open your Bibles to Psalm number 37, tell me 73. Psalm number 73. I want to share this, this psalm with you tonight. And uh, I think it says so much of what we're talking about. Instead of going on any further. And we're gonna, we'll, we'll pick up at uh, verse number 29 next Wednesday. The Lord being, our, Lord being willing. I may be moving next Wednesday night and I won't even come to church. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm joking. Psalm 73. Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. Now listen to this in verse number two. This is where we often stand. We compare ourselves with others' blessings, with others' situations. We compare. And the Bible says, but as for me, my step were almost gone. Probably my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. Remember what I talked to you a while ago about not giving up? Not letting discouraging times, those 20 years of waiting on the promises of God. This is where David says he was. He says, I'm in this situation that my feet were almost gone and steps had well nigh slipped. Some of you are contending for your relatives to be saved. You've just got to hang on. Don't get to looking around. Don't, don't listen. Sometimes Brother Roger tells about how his kids got saved. Don't be envious. Just keep on believing in your, in your heart and standing in your, for your situation. Sometimes we can get all sidetracked. I'm not saying he shouldn't share that. I'm just saying we can't use ourselves. Well, he must be doing something I'm not doing or a man I need. No, not necessarily. We just need to understand God keeps on working. Don't be moved by anything except to keep on standing and contending for what is right regardless. So then he says, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. Listen to this, for I was envious at the foolish. This, I wasn't even talking about the foolish. Sometimes we get envious of those who are blessed. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Now this is how he was looking at them from the outside. For there are no bands in their death, and their strength is firm. Boy, we can get to looking around at people, and they're just wonderful. They got it all together. Can't we? They are not in trouble as other men. Neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore, pride compasseth them about as a chain. Violence covereth them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness, and they have more than heart could wish. See what David's seen? All he's seen is how wonderful things are for them. 
They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore his people return hither and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. And they say, how does God know? And is there knowledge in the most high? You know, you know these kind of people, people that are just, they seem to not care anything about God. They don't, they're, they're hateful. They, they don't consider God in anything. And it seems like they get everything coming their way. That's what he's saying here. Behold, these are, the, uh, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. And he, then he goes on to look into himself and he says, Verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in, with innocency. He says, I, Man, I have wasted my life trying to live right. <laughs> look at all these people and how evil they are. Man, they're fat and they've got everything in the world just coming out their ears. They're blessed, they're blessed. And here I am, man, I have been serving God. I've cleansed my hands and my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocency. I, 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 it's kind of a wasted thing I've done. That's what he's saying here. For all the day long I have been plagued and chastened every morning. If I say I speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of my children. When I thought to know this, listen to this, it was too painful for me. I'm going to tell you some pain you're going to walk through if you compare yourself to other people. Going to always be looking around. You know, we're not supposed to be, uh, we're not supposed to be uh, horizontally minded. We're supposed to be vertically minded. Come on. We get to looking out here. We get to seeing things. This person got this prayer answered. This person got something done. This person got a blessing. <sighs> Come on. And he says, when I thought to know this, it was too painful for me until, here's the key, until I went into the sanctuary of God. You know something about the sanctuary of God? everything's all right <laughs> it's amazing to me I can be going through all kinds of struggle in my spirit and if I'll just shut up and go and get quiet in the presence of God sometimes I might spend a moment saying Lord I'm troubled God didn't want you to be troubled God didn't want you to struggle God didn't want you to worry None of that is good for you. It's not good for your health. It's not good for your life. It's not good for you to worry and struggle. Do y'all know that? Actually, let me tell you something. Worry is a sin. It's not good for you to do that. It's harmful. And I have gone before him and said, Lord, I'm worrying and that's a sin. Forgive me. And in his presence comes the fullness of joy. In his presence comes peace from the struggle. In his presence comes a lifting of that load that I was carrying. David said, I was all caught up in all this pain. I was going through this pain and it got to be too painful for me. And I want to say to you tonight, if it gets too painful for you and you get tired of toting it around, get in the sanctuary. Put everything else aside and go find a sanctuary in the presence of God. He said, then until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. Then God brought me truly back in, and refixed my focus where it was right. Up to this point, I thought those people were all doing great and I'm doing bad. But I went into the sanctuary of God and God made that adjustment on me. And this is what I knew. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou casteth them down into destruction. How are they brought into dis dissolution, dissolution? As in a moment they are utterly consumed with terrors. As a dream when one awaketh. So, O Lord, when thou awakest, thou shalt despise their image. Thus my heart was grieved and I was pricked in my reins. This is why his heart was grieved. So foolish was I and ignorant. I was as a beast before thee. 
He said, man, look at me. I was ignorant. I was as a beast before thee. And then he goes on with that, one of those nevertheless words. I love those words. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holden me with thy right hand. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel and afterward receive, receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For lo, they that are far from thee shall perish. Thou hast destroyed all them that go a-whoring from thee. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all thy works. What a powerful psalm that is. I just wanted to share that with you tonight. And, and I know that I moved through it quickly, but I want you to get this whole picture. The deception of the enemy will always cause you to look where you're not supposed to look. The enemy came to steal, to kill, and destroy. The one thing he wants to steal is your faith. He wants to steal the promises of God from your life. He wants to steal every good thing. I have been to the place, and before God gave me this revelation of grace in 92, honestly, I'm going to tell you all something. God, the devil had brought, uh, God had allowed me to go there because the Lord showed me that he, he allowed it. He had turned me over to the tormentors. That's where I was. Matthew 18 and 35, in case you'd like to read that verse. God turned me over to the tormentors. I lived a tormented life. I was so focused on everybody else that I had no hope and no love. The only people that I really knew that I loved was Jerry and Kathy. At that time, I don't even know if I had grandchildren. Maybe I did. I guess I loved them too. But the only two people in the world that I really knew that I loved was my two, two girls. And I'm going to tell you something. Listen to me. That is a horrible place to be. That is a horrible place to be. I lived in darkness. I lived with tormenting spirits 24 hours a day. At every quiet moment, I was tormented. All I saw was bad. I... I perceived all kind of evil things that were going to happen. Perception of evil. I'd get up in the night and walk the floors thinking, oh, this horrible thing's going to happen, that horrible thing's going to happen. Tormented in the night with tormenting spirits, tormenting me, fearful of everything in the world that was going to happen. Magnifying, I hope, I hope I can make this clear to you, magnifying darkness and despair. Like, I can't even begin to tell you. I walked the floor. Just, just making up in my mind horrible events that would happen to me, to my family, to the church, to my people, everybody. I just saw horrible things. I, I, I saw a horrible future, a fearful future for everything that I could think of. But listen, none of those things ever came to pass. None of them. But they were as real in my spirit as my breath was in my lungs. The enemy wants to take away your joy. He wants to take away your dreams, your hopes. He wants to take away everything God wants you to have. And if you, in the middle of your storm, keep your eyes on everybody else and everything that's happening around you, I promise you, you will end up in despair. And the enemy will magnify all kinds of things that you really don't want to have magnified in your life. But if you will look up. The psalmist said, I will lift up my eyes into the hills which come with my help, question mark. No, my help cometh from the Lord. Right. My help cometh from the Lord. And you know what? I don't know if I'll ever have. There'll be things other people have that's always going to be better than mine. There'll be people that live in bigger, finer houses than me. There'll be people that drive nicer cars than me. There'll be people that have 
more money than me that have all there if I look around I could always compare myself there's always going to be people that have better than me and do better than me and speak better than me and sing better than me and everything there's people better than me in this world but that doesn't matter because all that matters is God who's in me and I've got a feeling that everything's going to be all right Everything's going to be all right. So don't be fearful. Fear, fear, God didn't give you fear. If you have fear, it comes from the devil, not God. God's not going to give you fear. If you start having fear, get on your knees. Go to the sanctuary of God. Look to the one who brings peace, the one who's already provided peace. Get along in his presence. Confess your sin of doubt. Confess your sin of fear. And say, now, Lord, I'm looking to you. He is your rest. He is your provision. Amen. He knows what you need. It certainly doesn't hurt to ask him for what you need. But you don't have to struggle with it. You don't have to struggle. It's not wrong to ask him more than once. That's a misnomer too. People say, oh, if you don't, don't ask him but once. No, that's dumb. You keep contending. You keep contending for those things you desire that you know are lined up with his word. And stand in that confidence. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. You know that verse? Sit, look full in his wonderful face and the things of will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much.